Hello everybody, my name is AJ, this is the Mighty Glustic Channel, welcome to part 2 of many parts of a Monstrology of Wizards. Today for this video I'm going to talk about the schools of magic, or some of them, as many as I can get through, the arcane traditions and their roles. We're going to talk about what shape and format wizard schools can have, what are the essentials, how they can differ from each other, uh, where Eldritch Knights and Intuitive or Aligned Magic users fit in, if we have time. Uh, so the baseline is a large, well-established wizarding academy. This is a center of learning, a guild, and community of people devoted to intellectual studies, as well as magic. Wizards form an important part of the society they dwell in, and keep in mind there are a wide variety of intelligent races, different cultures. So all of these notes that I'm giving you are adaptable to, say, dwarven traditions or elven traditions, gnome culture, and so on. There's also what we would call, they're what we would call civilized races, but there is also the hobgoblin wizards, there's mind flayer wizards, and they have their own arcane subculture. The hobgoblins are fittingly brutal in their arcane culture, and was mind flayer set as a secondary technology to round out their psychic powers, but don't see it as superior. However, wizard brains are a supreme delicacy, and so they find the memory flavors quite addictive, and it is understandable that they would dabble in uh, the arcane just as much to emulate the addictive thrill of an excellent meal as for the learning itself. Wrap your head around that concept. Let me start with the school of abjuration. What role do abjurers have in a wizarding academy? Why would they be a class of wizard that you would frequently encounter first? Abjurers focus on barriers, resistance, protection, and countermeasures. They are the blue cards in Magic the Gathering. They are not overly liked by other wizards, but they have an important role in protecting the academy from outside attack or espionage, blocking infiltration, securing and restoring natural order, banishing supernatural entities, and protecting mundane people from arcane forces directed against them. So you can imagine, these are wizards who are almost anti-wizards. They are wary, they are often cautious, and have drawn are drawn to reading about the dangers of magic and how to defend or fortify against them. Abjurers are defensively focused. They deal with other wizards by deflecting their attacks and rendering them powerless, then taking them out with a most reliable but direct assault that they have in a display of unyielding power. Even a turtle has a powerful bite. Abjurers practice their art by locking doors, sealing containers, warding areas, patrolling boundaries, and guarding the ways in and out. They are proactive, and they practice games of tag with each other and their teachers. They prank each other, even at low level. Not so much fun in games, but more serious exercises. They go out into the world to serve as bodyguards and security advisors. They progress to being personal guardians to influential patrons. They investigate supernatural, serious supernatural incursions, and are the first line of defense when the bump in the night becomes a crash in the daylight. They focus on security, protection and being constantly on their guard. It permeates the life of the abjurer. Even their spell books are lessons on how to make a book a hard nut to crack and most likely loaded with very unpleasant deterrence to anyone who actually manages to get in and those who uh, yeah, manage to actually study it. Much like computer security, it is a game where there are those who try to get in and those who try to keep others out, and these methods are best kept secret. This makes it a school of wizardry that, again, encourages exploration and investigation by students and masters alike, because the spells and lore of abjurers are liable to be the most difficult to find and decode safely. Even so, abjurers will be studious, studious in their bookwork, making backup spellbooks, well protected, secured in multiple locations, and they have safe houses and defensible areas inside the academy from which they can make preparations for various worst case scenarios. They probably have a strained relationship with diviners and transmuters, as we'll get into, but frequently work with evokers and even necromancers as they hone their skills well against each other. Evokers, for instance, would welcome the opportunity to fire at somebody who can defend themselves. Abjurers learn a lot of complicated geometry, physics, symbology, and some of the most primal and ancient forms of magic. We're talking primordial magic. We're talking runes and things, wards and protective circles that giants and, think, and, and wizards of, of past ages, inhuman wizards, dragon wizards, crafted. The profession is well suited to those who are stoic, a little bit paranoid, and somewhat hard and unsympathetic. By alignment, I would say lawful neutral. They 
you could sum up a professional abjurer as a magic cop. I have a theory for some lore on one of the most powerful magical artifacts in the game. Long ago, a highly skilled abjurer experimented with making a shield that was not only invulnerable to destruction, but would itself be self-sustaining and neutralize anything that was directed against it. Working on some complicated theories, the abjurer directed arcane energy into a single point and it expanded it as it drew energy from the void within itself. But the second part of the abjurer's plan, to teleport inside the sphere once it expanded to a sufficient, sufficient size, using a control device specifically coded to the barrier, utterly failed. And as the co coordinates inside the sphere were wildly different than the abjurer predicted, what the abjurer had done was create a complete lack of anything inside the barrier, which caused a new universe to spontaneously appear, and the sphere hit a safety limit as it was suddenly drawing on some very exotic energy to sustain itself. And of course, the coordinates inside the sphere were now expanding at light speed according to its own internal laws and temporal physics. So there was no way to get a reliable location fix as it was now a different prime material universe. This baffled the abjurer and they considered it one of their worst blunders as they could no longer reverse or counter the effect and they had now had to deal with a dangerous artifact that they had created, a sphere of annihilation. Okay, on to the next school. Conjuration, the Conjurers. It might be easier to think of this as the school of transportation or teleportation or summoning. Conjuration is another school better suited to outgoing and investigative majors and those individuals probably pester uh, abjurers frequently for advice and techniques to ward off all manner of natural and supernatural pests and environments. They also make up the majority of wizards who go on to establish new schools, as they by far are the most widely travelled of all the wizards, because travel is what they seek to muster, uh, master. Conjurers immerse themselves in theory, understanding what they would call the basic techniques, but in reality these is a fiendishly difficult process devoted to thwarting the finer points of the laws of the universe, to make a thing that was there now appear here. Conjurers and diviners get along fairly well as they avail each other of their services so often in the course of their professional lives, they might as well work as two sides of the same business. I mean, it's in the best interest of a conjurer for a diviner to tell them where they're about to teleport into if they've never been there before, or come up with some sort of uh, item or artifact which allows them to see a, a location remotely before they teleport themselves bodily into who knows what. While the basic techniques of conjuration have led to a great body of variations for specific results, they are narrower in scope than the constantly adapting and expanding techniques of the abjurers, for instance. However, they do devote themselves in a similar manner to evokers in the utmost limits of their ability to shift raw arcane force, to leverage maximum willpower, to translocate a larger and larger quantity of mass over a greater and greater range, or to do it very subtly and finely. This makes it a school with a steep le initial learning curve and a high attrition rate at higher levels due to the mental and physical demands. However, for the conjurer, it's all worth it, for they have the multiverse at their beck and call. They can go anywhere. They can snatch fantastic creatures from across the universe and deposit them at their side. They ignore limitations of, of distance, uh, even time. For instance, the spell of Revivify allows a conjurer to reach back in time and return life force to someone who has recently died, been slain. That's a powerful ability. Conjurers have an enormous body of law concerning the nature of time and space, the existence of the planes of existence, guides to surviving in exotic, potentially lethal alien environments, and treatises on ways that matter and energy move through reality even a way that they can use the living network within a forest to transport themselves. The School of Conjuration is like the den of a pack rat. The shelves are groaning with curious and interesting artifacts from their many travels, and they have scuffed and ragged field guides and diaries that they have referenced uh, and constantly do reference for more formal volumes that they pen and sell at a great price. Conjurers make an excellent living transporting goods and people, writing guidebooks and sometimes collecting and selling items and living things from far-flung locations. So you can encounter conjurers pretty much anywhere, though for the most part they wouldn't be interested in whatever complicated methodical venture you've got going on, not when there is an entire universe out, for them, out there for them to explore and exploit. 
Discretion is the better part of valour, and nobody ever died from a swift retreat. Conjuration is a profession that is well suited to more chaotic alignments, and I advise if seeking an appointment with a conjurer, let them know well in advance, and never believe the sign on the door that says, back in 10 minutes. Conjurers and abjurers can work well together to create wizard enclaves that are larger on the inside than they are on the outside, or venues that are demiplanes that connect to reality via a single doorway, which may be permanently attached to a set location or travel when required. If you can imagine Doctor Who's TARDIS not being a travelling police phone booth, but rather a destination that attaches itself to the other side of a doorway in any location, so one moment the door just goes from bedroom to hallway, the next it opens into an enormous building that expands in every direction with even more demiplane connections inside it, some sort of arcane uh, matryoshka doll, also known as the Russian nesting doll with the wooden dolls inside wooden dolls inside wooden dolls. Anyway, that's one way you can insert a wizard academy in any location at any time or have it so that the internal architecture of any wizard school need not be completely logical not when they can create more space when they need it. Next school is divination. I bet you knew I was going to say that. <laughs> Sorry, I imagine you saw that joke coming. Oh, okay, diviners are an odd bunch. Without question, they tend to give people the heebie-jeebies just about as much as necromancers do. And this school of magic really suits the introspective, studious, introverted. Diviners, uh, in the rules, gain some nifty abilities such as rega uh, regaining divination spell slots and gaining a pool of pre-rolled d20 results that they can use during the game. It's pretty neat. Nice, nifty way of uh, inserting that mechanic. Replacing random dice rolls with a known number. But, what does this represent for the actual spellcaster? Diviners willingly delve and dive into a confusing maelstrom of probabilities and shifting sensations. The future is not set. It's like a kaleidoscope where the image is rearranging as the actions of the present echo forward, casting future reflections. Diviners practice an ancient law. They subject themselves to punishing sensory enhancement in an effort to expand senses that mortal creatures are not born with. Thankfully, the brain is a very adaptable organ and it automatically attempts to interpret and organise any information and sensation it receives. The pattern recognition is arduous, however, and diviners are liable to spend a lot of time nursing quite horrendous headaches. They certainly make use of natural substances that alter perception, so in cities where trafficking and hallucinogenic drugs is illegal, they would spend a fair amount of effort securing and maintaining a safe supply. Keep in mind, though, they are not imbibing powders, potions and mushroom brews, cactuses and toad slime for enjoyment. They treat these substances as performance-enhancing drugs, using them very carefully, because the stress that they are putting their mind under is e could easily result in a mishap with serious mental consequences. Uh, although a temporary psychotic break, seizures, schizophrenic episodes, or severe anxiety can be crippling, they can deal with it. I would think it's quite reasonable if a player with a diviner character advised a dungeon master that they would like to expend some of their spell components and slip a mickey into someone's food or drink that sent them right down the rabbit hole into their own private wonderland for a few hours. Of course, like any other wizard, the diviner looks for tools and means to lessen this consumable burden, so they attain crystal balls, reflective pools, mirrors, faceted glass and other devices that facilitate their access to mystical sensory stimulus. Of course, money is no problem for a wizard that can accurately predict future events. Even in our mundane world, there are those who make a tidy income from simple mathematical probabilities, taking sample polls and applying complicated formulae to predict a likely outcome. So leaders seek the counsel of diviners. Merchants pay to know when is a safe day to travel. Uh, farmers want to know what their seasonal weather is going to be like couples want to know about the best day to get married conceive a child and business innovators want to know if an investment in a venture will be profitable so diviners often shroud themselves in a standoffish aura they keep interactions not related to their business to a minimum and cherish the rare moments of rest and respite fiercely Many live a knife-edge existence battling addictions and mental health issues. They are frequently conflicted and often force themselves to stand by and just let events play out, knowing from experience, painful experience, that to interfere can just complicate things more because they know that the future 
they they know that interacting will throw the future into more turmoil and it makes it harder for them to decipher. They may have predicted many things and changing one could set of events set change set a chain of events in motion that will jeopardize their other predictions, resulting in errors that their clients have have already paid for. You see what I mean? So diviners, and who can blame them, may take solace in more direct means of relaxation, acquiring a more fatalistic mindset and as they become more experienced. In the words of Tyrion Lannister, they are drunk and they know things. All answers require payment advance, no refunds if you don't like what you hear. Diviner enclaves and apartments are more devoted to individual space, extensive pharmacopoeia, reference books. Uh, they will have waiting rooms and facilities for clients to come and go discreetly, and a lot of very clear signs that read, do not disturb. Divination is a profession that lends itself to those of a more neutral outlook. Uh, those apprentices of lawful or chaotic tendencies will find the constant interplay of good and bad consequences quite disturbing, particularly when the instructors are constantly hammering home that the best course of action is to do nothing, merely observe and report. As a DM, I find it particularly useful to deal with divination in the form of random images and keywords, and when uh, when required, simply insert these images and keywords into your description of what is going on so that the person playing the diviner or the group aware of the cryptic list become aware that they are in a significant moment. I purchased the Taroka deck of cards for just this purpose and use it every chance I get. The artwork and detail on those cards is just superb, worth every penny. I keep them in a snaplock plastic container and carry them around with my dice case. That important to me. Okay, time to take another break from the exploration of wizardry and answer a few of the comments from the last video. Yes, this seems like a popular theme for video, so I'll continue to make vids on the many character classes. I think the Druid and Ranger are pretty high on the request list, so I'll be covering them next. Also, I had a request to talk about how the religions of various gods work in Faerun, so a vid on clerics is a good opportunity to cover how the faiths appear, their festivals, vestments, and uh, that sort of thing. Yes, I will continue the Monster Ecology videos, of course, though I have some... Uh, had, I've had some good advice and I'll be changing the titles of upcoming coming videos just so it's more um, easy for people to find me on sort of random keyword searches and things so more people can get involved in the community. I don't have any plans at present to write a book on Dungeons and Dragons lore. In fact, I'm supposed to be writing a science fantasy source book, which I certainly intend to do, but yeah, being a YouTuber is very time consuming. I have taken to uploading the scripts for these videos on my Patreon page if you want to read them and see where I ad lib and uh, lose my place and go off on tangents and crack jokes during my uh, videos. Access to this is as easy as a dollar a month and patrons get personal access to me helping them out with anything they need, lore and inspiration wise. Patreon allows you to set a limit on how much per video you donate and a total monthly limit uh, of how much you donate. So yeah, if you want to compile my typo and error uh, spelling error written rambling into a document of your own, by all means, I don't mind. As I mentioned in earlier videos, there is a couple of guys doing really top quality videos on lore at the moment, uh, but even when two or more creators talk about the same topic, they always bring something new and unique to the subject, so I don't feel any competition with any channels that also talk about monsters, locations, history and character classes in Dungeons and Dragons. Far from it. I welcome collaboration and sharing resources, and I think the more the merrier. It just makes it that much easier for interested viewers to find a voice and presentation style that they enjoy. Uh, I'll be back with more on Wizards in the next video. Keep me informed with comments and let me know what else you want to know. And as always, thank you very much for listening. And if you're listening to this before bed, sweet dreams. <laughs>